Um, Linda Pippen. We have another update. Uh, Donna Redner has actually talked to her, and um, she is she's doing okay. And that we knew that she had power and water again, and um, but she did have a problem sometime during the summer and passed out in the yard and was there for a long time, got sunburned, yeah, and we don't know any more details out of that. So. Or how that's affected her, but uh, I just thought I could let y'all know. So if you do have an opportunity to talk with her, that you would do that. Well, this is this is going to be a, a a running few weeks here, <laughs> um, and I want, but I want y'all to please, if you have an opportunity to, uh, if you want to say something, that you go right ahead and interrupt us. So that we can address whatever it is that you have a question about. And I want to go over just the order for Michelle and me today. Uh, we've got first the title sheet. And then we have the outline for today. And then we have the filling the blank. There. And then this page, which is the one you need. Oh, I like that. And notes page. Now we did not. We 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 had some trouble with the computer. Both of them did. But uh, we felt like maybe it might be better for you to just write your own notes this time in your own handwriting. So that it might uh, that might be a better way for us to do the spiritual warfare. So that's how we started that. And here comes the Nancy's. And uh, does anybody else need sheets besides your Nancy? Has everybody got? We put them out. Okay. Sure. Yeah, yeah, right. right. Do you have sheets? Yeah. Where's the attendance sheet? I've got it. Okay. She's filling it out. Okay. Okay. And uh, Kathy, would you open us in play? Yes. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you and, and praise your excellent greatness, Father. You are great in every way, and we are in awe of you, that you would be our Abba Father, and we can call upon you at any moment, Father. Thank you so much for all you are to us and who you are, and we praise you and we thank you, Lord. And we ask you to show us anything we need to lay aside this weight and sin which does so easily beset us to run with patience the race set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith. Lord, help us to lay it all aside right now so that we can come before you with pure hearts, that we can listen to you as you speak to our hearts, Father. And this is so very important to follow your word, Lord. Show us your ways, O oh Lord. Teach us your paths. Lead us in your truth and teach us, for you are the God of our salvation. On, on you, we wait all the day. And we thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. I love the psalmist who said, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplication. Because he has inclined his ear unto me, therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. And we have that wonderful privilege, Lord. So teach us tonight exactly what you want us to uh, learn and apply in our lives, Father, so that um, unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think to you by the power within us, Lord, by your power, to you be all the glory, Father. For we pray all of this, Lord, and thank you. Um, be with um, Barbara and um, Michelle as they teach us, Lord. Give them all the words you want them to say and help us to understand. And we praise you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'll just leave these extras over here and take them. <laughs> and uh, we. We, we live in a world where, I don't know if you remember, but uh, just a few, a uh, couple of years ago, Matt had uh, a gentleman from 
Europe come and speak of us. And he was head of a large ministry in Europe. And he said that we are moving much faster than we think we are into a post-Christian environment. And that the time for us to sit on the fence has left. And I think he's correct. And I'm sure most of y'all think so too. This is a time where we really feel that we do need to be awakened and this church is an awakening church, which is a wonderful blessing for us. We're alive, we're doing God's work. Uh, everybody has on their hearts to be more like God and be more like Jesus. And that is exactly what we need to be doing in these days. So I'm going to start um, <clears throat> by just asking you, do you feel like you recognize spiritual warfare in your life or in the people around you? Yes. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I do. And sometimes I don't. Sometimes no. it surprises me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't realize that's what it is at first. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. And then as it develops further, mm -hmm. then we see the motives and mm -hmm. see what's happening. Define spiritual warfare. That is a very good question. I'm like, I was going to come up with that next for y'all. So, <laughs> who has an idea about that? <laughs> who has an idea about that? What would you say spiritual warfare is? It's when the devil or Satan are attacking you because they know our weaknesses and uh, they know that God has a plan for us and that we're trying to stay focused on in him and in his work. Mm -hmm. Good. I think the closer we get to God and the more that we walk in his will, I think it's just like arrows just all the time because we're doing his will. I know we experienced that when we before we moved up here last year and it was something that we had we decided to tithe on a Thursday, and this was before we ever moved up here, but we were involved in the church. We uh, had our life group, and we decided to tithe on a Thursday, starting to tithe on a Thursday, because Pastor Matt preached on that, and we were very convicted. And uh, on Monday, my husband lost his job. Nothing that he did. They were restructuring, and that's what happened. And it was just like, you can do what you want to do, but but uh, we were going to tie. But I just felt like we made the decision, and then it was like boom, you know. So I'm not saying that was safe. I felt like that was well, definitely. That's a warfare. Yeah, him saying, "Well, it's too bad. We're gonna make money. You're not gonna tie." I was like, "Oh yeah, well, yeah, we are." <laughs> And of course, the warfare began in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. And I think we all know that in Genesis 3, 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, I will put hostility between your seed and her seed. And then also, the battle is not between flesh and blood. The battle is spiritual. Mm -hmm. Just remember that when you're coming into a spiritual warfare with someone that you know or maybe you don't know that they are not really the battle the battle is spiritual so for our battle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers against the authorities against the world powers of this darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens and that's ephesians 6 12. And if we don't recognize that the battle is here, we're going to lose the battle, mm -hmm. whether it's a small battle or a big battle. Satan is the master of the sea and the father of lies, and he uses those tools to try to keep us from recognizing the spiritual battle. He attacks us in many ways. He uses things like health issues, stress, 
anxiety, despair, discouragement, temptation to attack us. And we don't always recognize those as spiritual battles, but sometimes they are. And if you have any question about that, you can always ask the Lord and he'll confirm it for you. The attacks on us, are, like he said, come, like I said, come in many ways. And he also uh, tries to discourage us, to discourage our spiritual growth, the obedience to the Lord. He hates nothing more than Christians who are trying to live a life pleasing to him. Every day we want to be more like Jesus, living a transformed life. And that is when Satan is going to really attack you the worst. And somebody said to me recently, well, if you're not really under attack, you're really not being a good Christian. You're not going out. You're not doing what you're supposed to do. And I really did not thought about it that way. But that's kind of a different way to, to look at it. Uh, <clears throat> Jesus has already won the war. We still have the battles that we have to go through. But Jesus has, has really won the war. He defeated Satan, sin, and death with his work while he was here and on the cross and his resurrection. But he must fight these battles until, but we must fight these battles until Jesus returns in victory to reclaim all that belongs to him. And we must make every effort to deny Satan his victories over us, over our minds and our hearts. Jesus gave us a mission. What was the mission he gave us? To disciples. To disciples. To what? Make disciples. Make dis to go and make disciples. That's right. Of all nations. And of course, we're very much into doing that. We do this locally, right here in this area. We do it in the state. We do it in the nation. And we do it across the world. So we do try to do that great commission that he has asked us to do. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. And we can't do this unless we are willing to do battle with the one who would do everything possible to stop us from doing what God wants. We are also told that we are supposed to live our lives walking in the spirit and not in the flesh. And I know we all try to do that, but I know that we probably all, I know I am sometimes not doing that. So, but we do need to try to do that in every day of our lives. I made that as my cover photo on my phone for a little while, oh. that verse. Because, you know, you did pick up your phone a lot, and I was just eating too much. And I wanted to <laughs> walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. So I, every time I pick up my phone, oh, yeah, I'm doing that right today. Oh, that's a good idea. So, yeah, I just made that as a, every time I put it up, it'd be right there. Mm -hmm. And who do y'all think we're battling for when we are battling Satan. Who do you think we're battling it for? Ourselves? Other people? Well, the lost. And if you're a teacher, the people that you're teaching. Mm -hmm. For yourself, your own soul. Mm -hmm. For that of your family and your friends. Also, churches are being attacked today. There are a lot of churches that are still struggling from when we went through COVID. Uh, there are churches that have closed their doors. I mean, you can share that, Michelle. You know, you're aware of that from working with the association. And <clears throat> we have to be careful to stay with the Word of God, and make sure that that is what is being taught, which I'm so grateful that every time I go in for a service. I know that Matt has sought the Lord. 
mm-hmm. every pastor yeah. has sought the Lord that comes to teach. Mm-hmm. We don't have to worry about that. We know that we're hearing the word of God. And it really is catching fire with all of us in every way when they come and speak to us. Mm-hmm. Also, our nation. We need to look far to see all the violence that is in our nation, the things that we're hearing about, uh, about the people that have come in. There are very good people that come in that are refugees and that are aliens to us and come into our country. But there have also been 421,000 that have come in that are criminals in these last few years. So we've got a real battle there. Anybody else have something that touches their heart there? The list is so long. Mm -hmm. I would say your family, and like I mean for me, like my marriage, my kids, you know, it's all very coming to light. Like maybe that's what's kind of been happening. Well, family thing comes back. I mean, so when the family's under attack, like it has been, you know, you have to do. It doesn't make for a healthy upbringing for children and it causes them trauma from the divorce even. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I believe definitely there's attack on family. I agree with that wholeheartedly. If we we have in on our watch we have seen prayer removed from the school. Mm-hmm. We have seen the Ten Commandments taken down. We have seen so many things that have happened. We are very blessed that we have a lot of judges right now that are not uh, liberal that are very conservative and uh, I'm hoping that some things are going to be coming back and I, I think we all continue to pray for that. <clears throat> the battle requires us to employ both offense and defense and any uh, general that is getting ready to go into a battle is going to set up an offense and a defense and take a really good look at both of those, all the elements of both of those. So I ask you to do that as we're going through this and see what you think you can use in your offense and what you feel like you can use in your defense. And uh, we must be on the alert at all times. Uh, About seven years ago, I was invited to the first uh, ever prayer conference worldwide that was just leaders and founders of ministries, large ministries. And we went, we were in London and um, there were 36 of us, I think. And they had me come to represent the churches worldwide. That was what I went to because I kept saying, I'm not qualified to come. And they said, but we want you to come for another reason. We want you to be the one who will represent the churches. And as we sat there the second day, we had five minutes that we were to pray and be quiet and then listen to the Lord for five minutes and see what we came up with. And it was absolutely amazing that when we finished, many of us had seen a vision of an older clock with Roman numerals on it with the hands at 11.55 a.m. And uh, we were all, we all gathered arms in the vision and locked arms together. And as we walked, the earth went away from us, but we did not fall because our eyes were all on Jesus. So when we left there, we decided we did, and Marty was very helpful here to promote it. And we put out something about 11.55 a.m. to be alert. And the Bible tells us to be alert. 
And right now, even more than ever, we need to do that. And if you ask the Lord to give you that alertness, he will. He will do that. And we did put that out everywhere. We put it on several websites, international websites and stuff, that we are at 1155. Now, some people say we're now already at 12. <laughs> I don't know about that, but some people feel that we are. <clears throat> So we must uh, be on the alert at all times, not just every now and then, but at all times. Jesus' statement to Peter in Matthew 16, 18 says that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. And that statement implies that both the church and Satan can be on the offense and on the defense. And I thought that was, I, I really had never thought about that verse, but that really kind of sunk in um, for me to look at that uh, in every situation that I come to. And we may be either depending on the situation the gates of hell are no match for the power of Jesus Christ. And I know that many of y'all are not aware of this or may not have thought about this, but I bet you a lot of y'all are watchmen on the walls. You might look up the watchmen verses in the Bible and just see what Jesus expected or God expected of you from being a watchman. And I bet you some more of y'all are gatekeepers. What, how do you spell watchman? W-A-T-C-H-M-A-N. A watchman is one that stands on the wall and looks for danger, looks for who's coming, recognizes whether it is danger or that it's good, and then he goes to tell the people that he reports to. The gatekeeper is the one who keeps the gate. And of course, that's how people would enter if they were going to have war with you. Most of the time, they're just going to come through. They're going to try to kind of beat your gate. So the gatekeeper has a lot of responsibility. And a lot of people that are watchmen are also gatekeepers. There's even uh, a watchman uh, conference that is held in Washington, D.C. every year. But just think about that, because we are, we are in times where we really need to be very careful about what we're watching and looking at and seeing and sharing that when it needs to be shared. Because that could mean the health and the well-being of all of your family, of yourself, of other people that you love. One other thing that I would like to uh, talk to you about is Satan has four D's. And those four D's are distraction, and leave space to write notes, diversion, derision, excuse me, deception, and division. And as we go through these, and we have this warfare training in these two days, uh, I would ask you to try to ascertain what you think your number one D is that bothers you the most. And then also your number two. And share that with us later. Distraction, misdirection is Warfare 101. Satan will constantly try to get you off track. And he does that with me all the time. Uh, the cares of the world are distracting, to be sure. Sometimes uh, even focusing on good things can be distracting. Uh, being really involved in Facebook or Twitter or TikTok or something like that. So the Lord repeatedly warns us, watch and pray. Stay on the alert. <clears throat> the second one, derision, 
Whenever he is not lying, he is running us down, making us feel that we are not who Jesus says we are. He brings up things from the past, and he'll tell you that you've not been forgiven for something, that you've asked forgiveness, and you know that Jesus gave you that forgiveness. That's what derision is? Mm -hmm. That's derision. What's a good example for that? Um, say that you asked the Lord to forgive you for something that you had done to a friend and he forgave you for that and then two weeks later you start getting the feeling that no I, I, I couldn't be forgiven for that oh the guilt. Guilt. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things for derision. <clears throat> Why doesn't God answer my prayers? Sometimes there's a reason. You don't see the whole picture. You're not quite ready. There's several reasons for not having that answer right now. That doesn't mean he's not going to answer it. It just means he's not ready to. Then deception. Jesus said, whenever Satan speaks a lie, which is all the time, he speaks from his own nature. He is the father of lies. Stronghold. Now, God can be a stronghold too. I think it's Psalm 38, but I can't remember exactly where it is. It talks about God being a stronghold in your life. That's a good stronghold. But Satan has strongholds too. You could have addictions, sins are founded upon lies. Promises never delivered. False advertising. We need to stand up against his deceptions by being on our knees with serious and disciplined prayer and staying instructed in what is true from the Bible. He will use lies to puff us up in pride. Or condemn us into depression. John 8.44 tells us that Satan is the father of lies and there is no truth in him at all. So just remember that when you're saying I don't feel real well and I just don't think I'll go to class tonight or I don't think I'll go on Sunday morning I'll just sleep a little longer. Think about where that's coming from and who that might be. You do have times that you really don't feel good and you have times you're not going to be here, but they will, I know when in the prayer room, when somebody takes an hour in the prayer room to pray, many times, that'll be the one time that, you know, like, who was it that had their battery? Was that you? you no, know, that was, no, yours was a tire. No. Mine had a battery. You had a battery situation, yeah. But you just never know when that is to keep you from something that you should be doing or that you should be doing for the Lord. So, Michelle and I and many others feel that we are very close to having uh, some major things happening. And we also see a lot of situations where um, we're seeing, like in California, there were 34 churches that got together at the place where the Jesus Revolution started in the 70s and had a service and had thousands that were that accepted Christ and hundreds that uh, did the baptism that day. And now we have Unite going which is, um, and a lot of church, a lot of churches are doing Unite 
uh, for the schools or with the schools, but they're not calling it Unite. And they're having uh, thousands of, of, of teens coming or thousands of young adults coming. And again, have a lot of salvations, having a lot of people that uh, are, that go ahead and, and have their uh, baptism at that time. So we're seeing a lot of things all around here in Alabama, Georgia, North and South Carolina, Tennessee, Arkansas. Uh, there's just been a lot of the Unite uh, and things for the college kids. And then also we, we're seeing more fires, they call them touches of salvation, uh, where there uh, are churches that are having revivals that go two or three weeks. And I'm going to turn it over to Michelle now, like our share with My name is Michelle Countryman. If you don't know me, I work for um, both Georgia Baptist and Noon Day Baptist Association. So I work at Baptist Collegiate Ministries at Kennesaw State. Hence the colorful um, uh, graphics. So I'm going to be teaching this. I'm going to actually teach the entire book of Ephesians starting tomorrow at Gabriel's Bakery. I don't know if we'll be there the whole time, but I've got maybe five that are coming tomorrow. So oh, that's a big teaching. increase. Well, that's I was good. amazed, and I don't know if they will all come, so I need y'all to pray, because that's where the warfare begins, is people say they're going to come, and they don't actually arrive. Is that mm -hmm. the emergency? What? Is that what the on Whitlock room? At the yeah, it's the bakery on Whitlock, so I've got, uh, we haven't, may even have a guy, so I had to change my graphic. I had to add a guy on here, just in case we have a guy that comes. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah. so uh, originally it was going to be just girls, but uh, just pray because um, Satan is after the younger generation. And, you know, I'd like to say that we're just all one big happy family at BCM, but, you know, we get students from churches all over the state. And there is a lot of controversy between the small churches and the large churches. And so then we try to get all these students together and, do things in unity, and that unity is not always there. So if you can think back, you know, 30, 40 years ago, the controversies that you had in your church, and then we came to Burnt Hickory, and we didn't have those controversies. Well, those controversies still exist in states, I mean, in churches in the states. So be in prayer for that. You know, the Southern Baptists were designed around a cooperative program, and we are not very co cooperative anymore. So pray for unity in our denomination. So last week, uh, I'll tell you what warfare looks like. I knew that I was going to be teaching this class, and then one of my students at BCM, she wants to be a missionary to Africa, and she says, Mrs. Kennedy, I need for you to teach me spiritual warfare. And so I said, okay. I said, yeah, you definitely cannot go to Africa and serve as a missionary if you don't know warfare. So as soon as it was determined I was going to teach that class, I found out that my dad had been scammed out of at least $24,000. So my husband and I took a trip to Alabama last week, the day that we left, the dishwasher broke. And when we got back, David found out the day before we were coming back that he was going to have to go to Augusta. So we drove from Mobile, Alabama to here. He had three hours and then he had to drive on to Augusta. And so I get in my car to go to work on Monday and the battery is dead. So that is warfare when you are about to teach spiritual warfare. And so I have done the prayer walks around the house. And I was like, you know what, Satan, if I have to get an Uber to drive me to this Bible study, you are not going to prevent me from teaching this class. And so I'm just done with Satan. And we can be just done with him because we have the power. And so I named this, the first page I want you to look at, it says, you got the power. And I know that that is incorrect grammar, but I teach, do teach college students, so I'm going to let you. <laughs> so when um, the first day that we went to Alabama was on a Tuesday, and so I decided my brother has been organizing this revival meeting, and a tenth revival of all things. Last week, he has a wonderful friend that he's had for probably 20 years. His name is John Bush, and he does these tent revivals. And sometimes he preaches, but the preacher last week was Ken Freeman. And so they had this huge lot. He said that the, it was a lot that's for sale, and the owner let them use it for free. 
the tent was all lit up so when you're driving down the main highway here is this tent with the big cross in the corner and so he, he and he tried to get all of the churches in his association to participate and lo and behold they would not so you know we are just not united anymore he had somebody tell him you know well tent revivals are old school so as a result of this revival the preacher not only preached in the tents, they went into the local schools, they invited sports teams to come. So 190 people were saved last week, including one of my nieces and my nephew, one of my nephews. And he said one of his friends, his all three of his children were saved. So tent revivals are not old school. Anytime you preach the gospel, God will have souls respond. And so there's a supernatural. You know, God says that the gospel is the power of God and salvation. So Greg, my brother, is on fire for the Lord. And he said, if the church won't do it, I will. And so this is what he told me. He says, we need a revival. He said that Charles Finney says that constantly praying for revival without doing anything does nothing. He also said, Jesus told the apostles to look at the crowd as sheep without a shepherd. Jesus had compassion on them. He told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Do you think they just prayed for God to send someone to go? No, the disciples went. Jesus sent them out two by two. They evangelized the people. They discipled them. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke to large uh, crowds, and they spoke in the marketplace. And the Lord added to the church daily. So we cannot just pray for revival. You know, the Great Commission is not go and pray. It's go. Go ye therefore into all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, teaching them to observe all things. And if you look at the Great Commission in Mark, it says to make disciples. Yeah. And we have failed in our discipleship making in our churches. And that is why we have lost the younger generation. We have entertained them. We have not discipled them. And they are unprepared for the world that they live in. And then we wonder why they go astray when they leave for college. And you know, the statistics say 70% of them leave the church after they graduate from high school. And we see that. There are so many prodigals. It's unbelievable. I have mothers all the time. Can you get so-and-so to come to BCM? Well, if you can't get them to come, I promise you I can't get them to come. So it is sad. It's going to take prayer to get them there, but yet we got to go. And uh, Greg also said that basically Jesus taught the disciples to see the lost, love them, go to them, and teach others to do the same. He did not tell them to sit back and do nothing but pray that God would send others to do the work. And he says the church needs to be the hands and feet of Jesus. If we are going to be God's army, we need to have endurance. And so that's why I teach Ephesians. So um, the outline for Ephesians can be as simple as sit, walk, stand, and bow. And uh, if you look at your outline here, down at the bottom, I kind of skipped my first two. I'll go back to those. Look at your outline, Ephesians 1 through 3. I'll, I'll title that sit. And do you know who you are in Christ? You know, we can't skip over to the armor of God and expect to do warfare if we don't know the entire book of Ephesians, we have to know where we're seated. We have to know what our authority is. And we have to know where Christ is seated. And we're going to go over some verses in a minute. Ephesians 4 through 5 are the walk chapters. And you know, in the books of Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, they all contain the walk verses. And you know what we like to do? Like in Philippians, we like to skip over to chapter four and read all the promises. And we say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But we fail to go through the walk chapters. Those promises are not for you if you are not walking worthy of your calling. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we have failed as a church. We want to claim the promises, but we don't want to walk the walk. And it does not work. We are a powerless church. So if you look at the first blank, it says the church needs more power. When you read the book of Acts, they had so much power in the early church. So, you know, many people are cessationists. And you know what that means? It means that they believe that that was for the church back then, but that's not for the church today. But when you go to Africa, you see all the miracles that God is doing. But he's not doing the miracles in America because he said that he couldn't do 
you know, when he went into uh, one of the towns, he says he could do few miracles there because of their unbelief. So our unbelief in the church is robbing us of our power. Mm -hmm. So the role of the church is the uh, the next blank. And so the church needs to be the hands and feet of Jesus. If we're going to be God's army, we need to have endurance. And this is why we're studying the book of Ephesians. There is more warfare. There is more to warfare than just head knowledge and rebuking. The entire book of Ephesians is needed to know how to handle Satan's spiritual attacks. And so uh, I think I gave you the first outline sit. The second one is walk. And the third one is stand. So if we learn where we are seated, if we learn how to walk worthy of God's calling, we're going to be able to stand firm in the evil day. And in the book of Ephesians, there are three prayers. So I call those the bow. The bow. So we need um, to be praying daily. So do you know who you are in Christ? Do you walk worthy of his calling? Do you know how to stand according to the word of God? And then are you spending time in prayer daily for yourself, your family, or the believers in your nation? So, you know, we can't expect to do warfare if we're not willing to put in the time to be prepared. So um, if you look at this sheet, now this, this sheet I gave you, it's the introduction to my Bible study, and I don't have time to go through all of this. So on the second page or the third page, I've kind of given you an outline, told who the author is, what the theme is, some of the key words. So that's just for you to uh, go home and look at and study. But look at the page that says, uh, has the key verse. And we're going to look at some of these verses really quickly in Ephesians. The key verse in Ephesians is Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And, you know, um, we have how many spiritual blessings does that verse say we have? Every, every, all of them. And, you know, we walk around like we're paupers in Christ. And those spiritual blessings, if you read uh, the first three chapters, you will see all the blessings that we have. And they're spiritual. They're not, you know, God doesn't promise to make us all millionaires on this earth. But we walk around like we're spiritual paupers. And we walk around like we're powerless. And, oh, Satan's beating me up and I can't do anything about it. We need to be the church in Acts if we're going to bring about revival and spiritual awakening in this nation. And so uh, the sit, Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in his trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved by faith and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. So that word sit, if you look at the Greek, it is present tense. So we are presently sitting in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And if you look in, I think it's the end of chapter one, it says that Christ is seated in the heavenly places, far above all the rulers and the principalities, and those are the demonic forces. So if Christ is seated above all the demonic forces, and we are seated in the heavenly places where Christ Jesus, where are we? Uh, above uh, what? Demonic the demonic forces. forces. And Jesus said in Mark 16, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and nothing by any means shall hurt you. So we have the power to defeat Satan, mm -hmm. and yet we're powerless. And it's because of our unbelief. And uh, this next section, walk, Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And if you look at chapters 4 through 5, there's a sin list. So your homework this week is to go through that list. And I want you to confess every sin that you are convicted of as you read it. And, you know, we cannot get rid of our sin. Christ gets rid of it for us. And he never forces himself on anybody. We have to be willing to repent and turn from our sin. And the church is powerless because we choose. We think that, you know, Jesus saved us from my sins. 
So therefore, it doesn't matter what I do now because I'm forgiven. And that's not what the Bible says. It says, be ye holy even as I am holy. And when the church walks in holiness again, the church will walk in power. Where did you say that sin list was? It's in uh, four, and four, four, and four and five. Ephesians four, four and five. five. Yeah, the outline is here. If you look, so it's sit is Ephesians one three three. Walk is Ephesians four three five. And then stand is Ephesians six. You know that's where we get the armor of God. And it says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Would somebody read uh, verse 10 for me? I don't have my Bible up here. I should call it up there. But I want to read also verse 10 because it also has the word stand in it. I have it. Uh -huh. Ephesians 6, verse 10. I have it. Uh -huh. All right. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his so we're commanded to be strong in the mm -hmm. Lord and in the power of whose might? His might. His might. You mean we have his power? Oh, wow. His might. You know that song by Jeremy Camp? It's called Same Power. And he says, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Do we live that way? No. We, we are powerless. Baptists are the worst. <laughs> and so... We need to regain our power. You know, my grandfather was a revival preacher. So he started his ministry in the 40s. He was a Southern Baptist preacher. And he was the executive secretary of the Kansas Baptist Convention. And at the height of his ministry, I mean, they even had in the newspapers, he was Mr. Kansas. And he would go and preach revivals. And they planted over 200 churches. And he preached differently than they preach today. His was a hard sermon. You know, you had you you went through your sin list when you listened to him preach, but that's that was the revival age, and that's when Billy Graham. He was just a few years older than Billy Graham. They started at about the same time, mm -hmm. but then there was a scandal, and he lost his position. And you know, this, the good Southern Baptist that we are, we smeared his name, and he never preached another revival message again. Mm -hmm. So. You know, we also are not a very loving church today. And if you sin, we apparently have no grace. You have grace when you're saved, but we don't have grace once you're saved. And so then, you know, we if you're a pastor and you fall from grace, we get rid of all your books from out of the uh, life way. You can't preach on, in a Southern Baptist pulpit anymore. And, you know, I asked at noonday whenever we had all the sex scandals and Johnny Hunt was being put through the ringer. And I was like, I asked him, I said, does grace not exist for the church? So I am uh, very outspoken. So <laughs> you will know what I have to say. But, you know, we got to start defending our people. Okay, he said 12 years ago. Do you think he might have already repented before the Lord, but yet we're going to destroy his entire ministry and take all of his books off? You know, and you, you can have your own opinions, but we need to be very careful of how we treat people in the church because Jesus says when he forgives, God says he casts their sin as far as the east is from the west and it's forgotten. And uh, Corey Tim Boone used to say that he casts it into the sea of forgetfulness and he puts up a no fishing sign. <laughs> so we need to walk the walk. We need to be a loving church. And then the last one, bow. Ephesians 3, 14 through 19, for this reason, I bow my knees to the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Are we strengthened right now in the body of Christ? No, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, there is that word love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Is the church today filled with all the fullness of God? No, because if we were, we would have our power. We would have our power plugged in and we would be, uh, our light bulbs would be on. So now let's go to... Um, do you see where it says bow number one and I have the big tower over the church picture? Mm -hmm. So we're going to take a close look at Ephesians 1 verses 18 and 19. Would somebody read that for me? 
uh, Ephesians 1, 18 and 19. Well, I can't read it because I have my glasses. <laughs> I have it here. I have it here. Have it. Okay. 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 Ephesians 1, 18 and 19. Yes. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power. I can continue on, but it does go into 20. That raised Christ from the dead okay. and seated him in the place. What of version Christ. is that? This is the NLT. I prefer New King okay. James. Let me this read it out of the NASB because there's some parts that are missing. Okay. It says in verse 19, these are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. So there are four Greek words for power in these verses. And... We already read that we have his power in us. So we need to know what kind of power that we have. So if you turn over, I made it easy for you. I'm not going to make you write these words down. I just gave it to you. So if you look at um, the verse above, it's and I accidentally, I wrote Ephesians 1, 19 through 20. I think that's actually 18 through 19. So sorry about that typo. So this word power is dunamis, and, you know, that is kind of a form of our word dynamite. And this word is used a lot in the book of Acts. And dunamis is physical power, force, might, ability, energy, and um, it's deeds showing power and marvelous works. And we can find that verse in 2 Timothy 1 through 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And then in Ephesians 6, 10 through 11, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So that word strong there is dunamis. Put on the full armor of God. So we are to be powerfully strong in the Lord. And have our armor on. The next word, if you look back at your verse, it says these are in accordance with the working. This word working is energy. In. How many of you could use more energy? <laughs> All right, so we can have God's energy. And you know, I have put this verse to the test because I was in a car accident. I've had a bad back for 20, over 20 years. And you know, I had all of these things. I was going to write this Bible study, all these things that I was going to do as soon as Christmas was over. I had a week, you know, vacation after Christmas. We were driving back from Alabama, and my son and I got rear-ended. And I could see my backyard from where we got rear-ended. And I told him, I said, I cannot believe we almost made it home. And I looked over at him, and I said, are you okay? He said, I'm fine, Mom, but are you okay? And I was like, nope, I could feel it from my neck all the way down to my back. You know, it's immediate. When you have a wreck, you can feel fine. And one second later, your whole body is just aching all over. So I needed God's energy. And then I had to go through intense uh, chiropractic and physical therapy for four months. It took up all my time. And I was like, Lord, I don't understand. You know, I was getting ready to do all of these things for you. And you know what he told me? He said, I want all your time. And I was like, wow, so he is really going to teach me how to die to self in the next four months because I have no spare time because I'm doing physical therapy twice a day, an hour each time, and I'm going to uh, the chiropractor. And why did I do all of that? Because I've had back pain for 20 years. This chiropractor knows how to correct the curves in my spine. And I was like, I got one shot with this doctor because he is expensive. And I'm not going to waste my time. So I did it all. And it has corrected some. I'm still going to him. But it did. It took all of my time. But I thought, you know, I'm learning how to die to self. But look at all the things that we waste our time on during the day that we don't necessarily have to be doing. Especially social media. You know, I mean, it has good things. But you can get wrapped up into social media so fast. You can just get sucked in and waste your whole day. So pray for God's divine energy. It typically refers to God's energy, which transitions the believer from point to point in his plan. In a verse, it's also used in Colossians 1.29. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Wow. So God was working his energy in Paul. 
well, I want that. I want God to work his energy in me because I need more. And so start praying. This, uh, I didn't even mention this. Um, Ephesians 1, I didn't write it down. There are three prayers in Ephesians. Oh, I think there are written down here. This is within one of the prayers. And these mm -hmm. prayers are for the church. So the prayer is Ephesians 1, 15 through 19. I go through all of Paul's prayers in the book of the New Testament, and I pray them for the church. All of Paul's prayers are for the church. He does not very rarely pray for himself. And very rarely does he even pray for protection. You know what he prays for instead of protection? Boldness. Lord, I pray that I will have boldness to speak your word. You know, if he's in prison or standing before kings. So he is praying for power and boldness rather than just sinking behind, you know, oh, Lord, just protect me. I'm going to go hide in my corner, Lord, just protect me. Don't let anything bad happen to me. Paul was like, no, I'm going to go stand before the king, and I'm praying that the Lord is going to give me boldness to be able to do what I need to do when I get there. So um, the next one is Iskus, and it is uh, there in accordance with the working of the strength or Iskus. And this word means strength, power, might, force, ability. And it's properly a force to overcoming immediate resistance. Well, where does that resistance come from? Satan. So we have the power within us to immediately overcome the resistance. And uh, Philippians 4.13, I can do is coast all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that word strength there is in dynamite, which is uh, a form of the word dunamis. And that's to fill with power, strengthen, and make strong. So now when you look at that verse, it has a whole new meaning. So you can have God's energy to do all things because he strengthens us with dynamite power. And Ephesians 6.10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. His strength, we have that power. The last one is Kratos, and it is the word of his might, and it means dominion, strength, power, a mighty deed. And the root there, it's exerted power. So that word is also used in Ephesians 6, 10 through 11. Finally, my brethren, be strong, and that's another word for dynamis, in the Lord and in the power is coast of his might, Kratos. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. So, you know, we sit here and we're like, man, Satan's just beating me up. Well, you're not fighting the battle. God's given you all the power and all the tools that you need to fight the battle. But we lose the battles because we don't know what God's word says. And then a lot of times we just don't even believe what it says. So on the back... It says, you have the power of God inside of you. It is time to use it to defeat the schemes of Satan and become the hands and feet of Jesus. So you must put on the full armor of God. And we're going to go over the armor of God next week. But I want you to read this because I have questions for you. You know, it says, girded loins with truth. Are you studying the word and memorizing? And I should have put in there daily. Have you put on the breastplate of righteousness? Are you living according to God's commands? Have you shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace? And you know, a lot of people misinterpret this verse. This verse does not mean the shoes of peace. This means, are you prepared to share the gospel anytime, anywhere? And so do you know how to share your faith with the lost and dying world? Every time someone is saved, Satan experiences defeat. You know, the Bible says, how beautiful are the feet of them who bring good news. So do you have beautiful feet? You know, we spend a lot of time painting our toenails if you're a girl and making them all pretty. Well, that means nothing to the Lord. We have pretty feet if we're sharing the good news. And take up the shield of faith. How is your faith? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Take up the helmet of salvation. Are you saved? Spiritual warfare many times takes place in our mind. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And then pray at all times in the spirit. So your, the summary is, do you have a daily prayer time? Do you pray for other believers? Do you pray Paul's prayers for the believers? Do you have your armor on? And so don't even begin to think that you can do spiritual warfare if you can't answer yes 
to all those questions because you will be defeated. And I could give you stories. I don't like to go into stories, but I've read lots of books on warfare. And one of the pastors one time tried to cast the demons out of a woman. And the demons told him, you can't do it because you're unclean. Well, it came out about a week or two later that the pastor was having an affair. So you can't, you don't have power over Satan if you're walking in sin. And Satan knows it. You can't fool Satan. It's like, you know, I've been diagnosed with pre-diabetes and so my blood sugar doesn't spike as high as diabetes. But, you know, I've learned that you can't hide the sugar. You, know, you can't eat this much and then have a little bit of sugar and eat this much. <laughs> Your body is going to find the sugar. God knows the sin, no matter how small, no matter how big. Satan knows your sin. If you want power, get rid of the sin. So um, that's all for this week. Thank you. Need to preach up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, not everybody wants to hear me, unfortunately. Yeah. So uh, that's okay. So y'all pray. You know, that. Paul used to ask the church to pray for open doors. Y'all pray for open doors for me because um, I teach on the filling of the Holy Spirit, and there's a lot of Baptists that don't believe that, and so therefore I get shut down. So. We are in a spiritual battle, and it takes more than one person praying. So I need for you to pray for me at BCM that the Lord will open doors because the students are not all receptive of the revival message. And so it takes more than one person praying for the uh, younger generation, for all of our nation. And I am, I am a witness to that because she has tried and tried, and she has been so. Yes. <laughs> If y'all would pray for that, that would be great. But, you know, it's amazing. The Lord had closed, I mean, not the Lord, the, a door was closed, and I kept praying, Lord, I don't understand. And then a week later, he just kept saying, wait until you talk to so-and-so. A week later, when I talked to her, the Lord opened the door, and I'm having a Bible study at Gabriel's. So I don't know what the Lord is going to do with this Bible study. You know, a lot of times my Bible studies are small, so maybe it will be a small group, or who knows, maybe it will be the spark for revival. So just pray. Marita Perks has a lot of young people. What? Let's go to it. Marita Perks, the coffee shop. Let's go to it. Has a lot of teenagers that go in there. Which Perks? Where is that? It's, are you talking about the Gabriel's on Whitlock? Yeah. yeah. Perks is right next door to it. You know, I think that's where Anna Grace works is Perks. Mm -hmm. So she's the one that got the people ready. And we were going to have the Bible study at my house, but one of the girls cannot drive. So they wanted to have it at Gabriel. So I don't even know if Johnny Gabriel knows we're going to have a lot of Sunday. That's funny. Last time I talked to you, you were going to have it at the house with one person. Exactly. And she says, she says, pray that I have enough sex to ask people to come. And then the next day she texts me and says, well, I've got two girls from work and maybe one of her boyfriends and maybe her husband's coming. So she is a college student who's been but I have gone over my time, so. Uh, well, no, I think this is great. I mean, I this know. really is, this <laughs> really is the time that we need to be taking a really good look at what we're doing with our life. So I think it's great. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. Thing. Great job, Michelle. Yeah. Well, pray for the powers for you and for the church, because if you look at that entire prayer, Paul is praying for the church. And it, it's really, it's really all God's power. It's not ours. It's yeah. all his and him working through us for healing. So, and and I have actually seen, I have been in a service where I actually saw a little seven-year-old girl's foot totally reformed right in my presence. Mm -hmm. I was like as far away as from here to here. Mm -hmm. So there are things done that that we don't think about in this day and age and discipleship is now coming back in a hundred percent because so many of the leaders in the church realize that we not just the Baptists but Presbyterian Methodists we all just kind of abandoned discipleship for about 30 years and we didn't mean to you know it's just they took missions and other things uh, so but that's coming back in and you'll see that a lot in our church too well, the BCM Georgia Baptist is bringing um, really stressing discipleship with the BCMs across the state. So. so, yeah. So it's not like we don't see it and we're not doing anything. We are, you know. But I think this is all part of this awakening. 
that God has for us. Connie, you want to just close this? Yeah. Holy Father, thank you so much for being with us tonight, for speaking to us through Michelle. Um, we appreciate so much, Father, the call to be, to be aware, to be alert, um, to be on our guard, Father. We need to take this so seriously. We need to see what is going on around us and realize what we have let go of as Christians over the years by our lack of faithfulness, Father, our lack of belief, and our waiting for someone else to do it or not being diligent. We ask that you forgive us, that we would take this so seriously, that we would read and study to show ourselves approved, Father, that we would make sure that we are living close to you and walking with you. <clears throat> I pray that you bless Michelle in all that she is endeavoring to do, that you'd use her bodily, Father. She's willing and open, and I just pray that she would go in the direction that you want her to go, and you would give her wisdom and discernment and to bring those to her, Father, that need to be told. We ask that you give safety and protection to all traveling home tonight, and we just thank you for this time with you. In the holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank y'all for coming. See you next week. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you.